This is Newswatch 7 and 4 with Jerry Meyer and Donna Becker, Dave Barron's weather, and Charlie Winham Sports. Good evening, I'm Donna Becker. And I'm Jerry Meyer. Trevor City's Munson Medical Center once sat in a large open space, but now it's a huge facility straining against a residential area. TV 7 and 4's Claire Radicke reports on a meeting to address the traffic problems that that creates. People who live near Munson Medical Center are familiar with heavy traffic. Congestion is on the rise, and residents there are concerned about saving their neighborhood. It can be quite bad. Uh, with uh, any further hospital expansion or any further use of the state hospital grounds, it's going to become worse. Officials from Traverse City and Garfield Township are working with Munson to find a solution to the problem, and they're holding public hearings to gather information from the residents. The group has formulated five possible solutions to the traffic problem. They range from a do-nothing plan to a complete overhaul of the neighborhood. And they range from something that is very, very neighborhood, I mean, in my opinion at least, very, very neighborhood oriented, trying to save a residential neighborhood and trying to separate it distinctly from the other uses that are in the area. Uh, at the other end of the scale, we have alternatives that really emphasize access. The group will use the input it gathers to devise a final plan for the neighborhood. Claire Radicke, Newswatch 7 and 4, Traverse City. And for those who didn't get to tonight's meeting, another one will be held. Donna? If you're interested in the Michigan Education Trust Program of Guaranteed College Tuition, this year's deadline is November 9th. The program's executive director was in Traverse City tonight to explain the three-year-old program and outline several new payment options which have been added. We're offering two new payment plans this year. We've got a monthly purchase plan where a purchaser could pay each month through a coupon book. We would send them and they would turn around and send each, a coupon to us each month with a check. Or if their employer is willing, they can sign up through a payroll deduction plan. And we've had calls from literally hundreds of employers that are willing to offer this to their employees this year. Some 200 students are now using their MET program to attend college. The state has a toll-free number, which is 1-800-MET-4-KIDS. Election Day is still a week away, and as the candidates jockey for position, election officials at all statewide government levels are gearing up for voter turnout November 6th. And as in planning any big event, county officials find themselves in the midst of their annual busy season. It's a very busy time for the county clerk's office because we run the county election. We have to provide the supplies, order and provide the supplies, order and provide the ballots, uh, the machine strips, and uh, make sure that in everything is correct. There's no misspelling. It's, it's, it's interesting, but it's busy. Watson says the next big task for her office is to prepare the canvassers record so they'll be able to go over the paperwork handled by the local clerks the day after the election. Jerry? Well, tomorrow night, little ghosts and goblins take to the streets in search of hopefully more treats than tricks. In the past, we've all heard about some of the dreadful tricks played on our children in the form of tainted candy. But as Steve Gendell reports, the chances of getting any tainted candy are very slight. Halloween approaches, and parents worry about poisoned candy or razor blades and apples. Some hospitals even go so far as to x-ray Halloween treats for signs of tampering. As far back as 1975, Newsweek magazine reported hundreds of children have narrowly escaped injury from razor blades, glass, and needles in their goodies. And several children have died. But a closer examination of the facts shows that most of these reports are unfounded. This level of panic is not warranted at all. I don't think it's as nearly as serious as parents think, but I think that it does reflect the fact that people are afraid about their neighborhood. They're afraid about their city. They're anxious about what's going on around them. In fact, despite that 1975 report of deaths and injuries, a new book called Threatened Children has found only 20 cases of verified Halloween tampering dating all the way back to 1958. And they were just minor cuts and puncture wounds. The very worst required only 11 stitches. And two reported deaths turned out not to be anonymous Halloween tampering at all. Five-year-old Kevin Tostin, who died in 1970 from heroin, didn't get it from candy, but from his uncle's home. An eight-year-old Timothy O'Brien died in 1974 after eating cyanide-laced candy, but in 
Investigators say his own father supplied the poison. That's not to say tampering never happens. It does. But it's not always associated with Halloween. And the largest number of scares in recent years was sparked by the Tylenol tamperings in 1982. We don't see children who are injured by this kind of thing, and I suspect it's very rare. So there's no need to panic. Just use common sense. Restrict your children to familiar homes and familiar neighborhoods. Don't eat the goodies until you get home and can look them over. And don't be distracted from the bigger risks on Halloween of children getting hit by a car as they roam the streets in the dark. Steve Gendel in Los Angeles for NBC News. Well, it appears the Devil's Night across northern Michigan has been pretty quiet. In Grand Traverse County State Police reports some egg throwing, minor vandalism, and some trouble in getting large congregations of kids to break up. In Manistee, it was pretty much the same with some noise complaints and packs of kids roaming around. It was quiet in Petoskey and Cadillac. Sheboygan had some disturbances last night, but a quiet night tonight. And in Gaylord, some leaf fires and toilet papering, but otherwise a rather non-memorable Devil's Night here in northern Michigan. Good advice there for <coughs> trick-or-treating. Certainly the greatest threat is from, uh, due to poor visibility and, and the costumes that are often are so dark and, and hard to see. Yeah. We had that report on earlier from uh, at 6 o'clock from one of our local officials about a light inside of a, a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. Great way to, for the kids to show up. Mm -hmm. Hey, we've got some good weather for trick-or-treating, so the safety rules will apply. We'll talk about the weather in a minute. Well, I've commented the past two days now about the uh, very evenness of our weather. We've had two nice days in a row, another one tomorrow, pretty good day on Thursday. We didn't have four days of really good weather. We haven't had very often since last May, as a matter of fact. One measure of that, temperatures tonight, within a degree or two at all locations of exactly where we were last night a at this hour. And I think we'll be very much in the same location in terms of temperature again tomorrow night. Daytime high temperatures as well. They're going to be mild for maybe even five days in a row, and that's been unusual since last May. Mild at least for this time of the year. Now, high uh, barometers right now and rising, and, uh, they're going to begin to fall a little bit. I think they will have fallen just a bit by this time tomorrow night. Winds light and variable now. We will move into about a four to five day spell, however, of southerly winds, and those will get started tomorrow. And at one point, they're going to become uh, quite strong. Well, not much happening east of the Rockies across the nation today. Some cold air actually dragging through New England, finishing its push through New England and just on the edge here, bumping into some warmer air to the south. So clouds that fell southward across the state today, and that was the only wrinkle for us. Here comes the first wave of energy of what is going to become, well, it already is a lot of activity out west, but the first wave of energy breaking to the east. Now, I think we're going to have a good bit of sunshine tomorrow, but this thing's going to move in tomorrow night. I think we'll have partly cloudy conditions. It's going to thin out. It's going to dry up some as it moves along. But we'll call it partly cloudy for trick-or-treat trick or night and some breezes as well. Winds are going to pick up, and then I think we will have some clouds in the sky during the day on Thursday. Out west, big storm, not visible now. It's really pulled its energy south. We will continue to see it uh, develop off to the south. And here comes a lot of moisture from an old hurricane. This is storm, Trudy, now pumping the moisture north. Energy coming from the south is going to combine pretty big storm in the next couple of days out there. Yes, in the 30s tonight, again tomorrow night and the next night, and 50s for tomorrow, I think we'll edge upward where we might even hit the upper 60s on Thursday. But generally, mild temperatures for this time of the year. And there it is for Wednesday. The warm southerly winds, boy, I think they're going to last about four days, which is amazing. Here we go, forecast overnight hours now. We are looking at a nice night tonight. Light and variable winds with clear skies, temperatures 30 to 35, so perhaps a little cooler than we were last night. Now, for tomorrow, we're looking at lots of sunshine, at least through the first half of the day. Then the winds will pick up, and I think by late tomorrow afternoon, we will have partly cloudy conditions. And temperatures, well, maybe upper 50s, or upper uh, 50s for tomorrow. Now, tomorrow night, partly cloudy, breezy. That's the trick-or-treat night, much better than last year. And for the next day, partly cloudy, warmer, temperatures upper 60s. We might hit 70 in downtown Traverse City and another location or two, so that's pretty good. Okay, you know, a number of the police officers I talked to tonight commented how uh, pleased they were that Devil's Night was so quiet, especially considering the warm weather. Yeah, they were a little afraid of that. It's a little more inducive to people being outside than a year ago. Yeah. You said it's been wilder than that here in the studio. Yeah, that's true. Almost was a minute just ago. Thank you, Dave. Still ahead.
ahead on Newswatch, a possible key to the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. And President Bush discusses possible military action in the Gulf. Stay with us. NBC News reported tonight that an inquiry into the crash of Pan Am Flight 103 just before Christmas two years ago is focusing on a Detroit man in his connection to American drug officials. The report centers on speculation that political terrorists may have learned that Pan Am flights from Frankfurt, Germany were being used by the DEA as part of an undercover operation to fly informants and suitcases of heroin into Detroit as part of a sting operation. A 20-year-old Detroit man who died on Pan Am Flight 103 had been recruited by the DEA as an informant and may have been tricked into carrying a bomb onto the plane. The usual security checks in Frankfurt apparently were being bypassed. The DEA says there is no evidence yet to substantiate that its undercover operations were involved, but it expects to have some answers by the end of the week. Well, the rhetoric from the White House is escalating as the buildup continues in the Middle East. Tonight, Steve Handelsman reports on the day's developments, including another military mishap. In the most recent accident, a high-pressure steam pipe ruptured aboard the assault ship Iwo Jima in the Persian Gulf overnight, and eight seamen were killed. The ship's crew was visibly stunned today as they returned to port, where the skipper had a message. That the crew is pulling together on this one in our typical Iwo Jima fashion that we will overcome this uh, terrible setback. Seamen critically injured in the blast were helicoptered to the U.S. Navy hospital ship Comfort. Also here were three sailors injured yesterday when a Marine sentry fired on their truck as it approached his guard post. In a third accident, one Marine was killed and three injured last night when their Humvee vehicle, like this one, flew off a 20-foot embankment in the Saudi desert. Since Operation Desert Shield began August 7th, 40 U.S. servicemen have been killed, most in aircraft crashes. But Pentagon spokesman Bob Hall said today that's not a surprising death toll. One, you've got a large number of troops being intensively trained and exercised uh, on, a, on, a, on a big picture sense. It's not an alarmingly large number. President Bush, who knows thousands of Americans could die if there's war, called in congressional leaders today for a session on the Gulf. They found him willing to give sanctions more time but also willing to use the military option. Does the president have a green light to do what he feels is necessary? Not a green light, but there's a yellow light there. There's no question that there's a concern on Capitol Hill with all the uh, press accounts and all the statements being made that this is somehow a prelude to immediate military action. But the message today from the White House to Congress is that's not the case, that the president remains patient. At the same time, Bush is said to be considering calling up another 100,000 U.S. troops, at the very least to intimidate Saddam Hussein, who warned his top generals today that the Americans are planning to attack. On Capitol Hill, this is Steve Handelsman for NBC News. A former California winery worker has been convicted of six counts of first-degree murder for a rampage last year that left seven people dead, including his wife and two young daughters and three of his in-laws. The jury in Redwood City, California, also found Ramon Salcido guilty of second-degree murder in the seventh slaying and two counts of attempted murder. Under California law, Salcido could be sentenced to death in the gas chamber. The U.S. Supreme Court is looking into whether the government should be allowed to make workers at subsidized family planning centers keep quiet about abortion. A lawyer for those who want an end to the rule says it's an infringement on free speech. A lawyer for the government says it's a permissible restriction on the scope of the program. Questions by the court's newest member, David Souter, indicate he's troubled by the idea that a doctor can't tell a woman that she needs an abortion to prevent her own death. Siri? Well, Shirley Winnem, any of you surprises in uh, girls' high school basketball tonight? I don't know. I'll tell you in, after this commercial break, but I'll also tell you there's a very, very good bas uh, basketball team and also a good soccer team, that being Petoskey. I'll tell you all about sports is next. Coming up. And good evening, everyone. The next time you want to look for some balanced, unselfish play, just look to the Glen Lake girls basketball team. Glen Lake hosted Misick, and it was Sweet 16 tonight for Stacy Cheramani. But the party was solely for Glen Lake to enjoy. Karen Miller with the steal. She's going to go coast to coast for the deuce. 
That's a move that'll blow out any Bulldog scandal. But wait, Nicole Hacker had a notion and a response with a three-pointer off the board. Count it. The Lakers, however, would outlast Misik. Five players scored in double figures. Jennifer Budd scores. She's fouled. Count it. And count a Lady Laker win. Final score, 66 to 34. Over in Cal Casca tonight, number 11 in Class B Gaylord visited. Gaylord's Kelly Krajin, uh, Krajniak finds teammate Dee Pagel for the easy two on the fast break. But Cal Casca would put together good ball movement. Tooney Fliss would finish things off with a pretty jumper from the top of the key. Second half with the score tied at 40. Kelly Krajniak proved why she's one of the best in the state. She would score at all the right moments. Kelly would help lead her Lady Blue Devils to their 15th win against only two losses on the year. Close one tonight in Kalkaska. Gaylord wins it, however, 46 to 40. On to the scoreboard. We find out other games going on in the North Country. Buckley defeated Bear Lake, and Ross Common was a winner over Farwell. Angie Stoop scored 33 in Benzie's big win, and Lake Lake Lila St. Mary's beat the Traverse City freshman tonight. Kingsley hammered Onekum up, and in double overtime, Harbor Springs outlasted a Lanson. Emily Lathenquist scored 21. Brethren beats Manton, and Atlanta overwhelms Central Lake. Manistee looking golden. They beat Cadillac, and McVeigh Northern Christian won by 10. Christy Gretzmaker scored 23. Sutton's Bay beats Frankfurt. Marion comes out on top tonight. Reed City's Kirsta Campbell scored 23. And turn out the lights time for the folks in Sheboygan as they beat Rogers City. Other winners tonight include Cedarville and Fairview upsetting number five in Class D, Joburg. East Jordan and Ottawa Cardinals chalk up a W tonight as well. Well, tonight at 6, I told you Traverse City and Elk Rapids were the top soccer teams in the North Country. But Petoskey soccer coach Carl Barakovich got right on the horn to tell me that his Class B club is playoff bound as well. In fact, his Northmen have outscored opponents this season 100 to 13. This Wednesday, Petoskey takes on Bloomfield Hills Cranbrook in the first round of regionals. And good luck, Petoskey, and thanks for the correction. Going into tonight's Detroit Red Wings game, Detroit had not lost a game at the Joe Louis Arena this year. But keeping the streak would not be easy as the St. Louis Blues came into Motown. Brent Fedick draws first blood with the third, uh, third goal of his year. Sergei Fedorov chalks up the assist. Later than a minute later, or less than a minute later, rather, Blues Paul Cavallini finds teammate Sergio Momesso to tie it up with the empty net goal. That's made the score one apiece. Gerard Gallant would make it two all in the second period, but the Blues would spoil the Wings' home record, beating Detroit by the final count of five to two. And St. Louis now takes first place, sole possession, in fact, the first place in the Norris division. The Detroit Pistons wrapped up the exhibition season tonight in Springfield, Massachusetts. Detroit was playing Houston, and the Rockets blew out to a 10-2 lead. Nifty moves like this one by Kenny Williams led the way early for Houston, but Joe Dumars led the Pistons' cause on the other side of the court. This time, he would lead the defense in so Mark Aguirre could have an easy two. Pistons go on to win. Final count, 113-104. to The regular season starts Friday for Detroit against Milwaukee. And so we can finally say hello to the regular season. Good. I'm kind of tired of seeing all the, all the Pistons playing exhibition games. I want to see it count for a change. Yeah. Now hopefully they'll be, well, they're getting healthy. They're getting better. They're getting much healthy, healthier. In fact, this was the first game they were able to have all their healthy starters out there after getting beat up during the exhibition season. Yeah. Well, that's the time to get beat up, right? And get strong for the regular season. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Whatever. Makes sense to me. <laughs> well, the Space Shuttle Columbia passes its fueling test with flying colors. We'll have that story for you when News Watch continues. Well, it looks as though the Shuttle Columbia could take to the skies as early as December. After today's fueling test at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, NASA officials proclaimed the shuttle virtually leak-free. Columbia had been plagued by hydrogen leaks. Since then, the engineers have installed new hydrogen lines. A crushed seal was replaced, and numerous joints were tightened. So Columbia is looking good. Sure Let's is. See how the weather's looking. Yeah. Okay. Let's when's go past the good stuff. Yeah, when's the party over? <laughs> Thursday. Thursday. It's all over Thursday. Okay. Yeah, we'll see lots of clouds moving in Thursday, and then I'm, I'm afraid we've got rain mm -hmm. Thursday night. Well, starting sometime Thursday night, but then we can count on it. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we will have rain. There it is. Temperatures mm -hmm. holding nicely, however, through Saturday, then falling off on Sunday. 
So that means a full week of 50 degree temperatures and mm. we haven't, you know, for the, compared to what it should be this time of the year, that's normal and we haven't had five days of normal temperatures since, I, it's got to be last June or May. No, I don't know why I asked you that question, when's the rain going to come? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, uh, we could all predict that. Well, we don't really need you. <laughs> yeah, we can. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dave. That's our report. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night.